welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am, as always, delighted to be with you on this Tuesday, the first of two episodes we have this week, the first of two author interviews I have for you this week. As we get started, I would like to remind you, as I always do, to please like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to or watching this episode on. That really does help the algorithm to get the uh, podcast out to more readers such as yourselves. Also, if you want to support not only this podcast, but the entire network in a different way, you can go to gsmcpodcast.info. You see that in the video playing next to me. And there you can leave a tip or a donation. Uh, If you want to also leave a question or a comment with that tip or donation, you can do that. I would be happy to engage with anything that you have for me to um, comment on or answer questions. That would be great. I'll do that at the beginning of an episode after I receive said question or comment. But you can also just go and uh, leave a tip or donation at gsmcpodcast.info. Like I said, that helps not only this this podcast, (laughs) this episode, this podcast, but the entire network as a whole. Thank you as always for all of the support that you give. It is greatly appreciated whatever form that support comes in. So how is your week going? Uh, Last week was the 4th of July. Did you get a long weekend? It was obviously July 4th here, but it's not the 4th of July that, you know, because I'm not in the U.S., so it's not celebrated in Portugal, obviously. Um, My husband and I acknowledged it and um, celebrated it in our own way, but I, my heart is always on Flathead Lake on the 4th of July. My grandmother's sister, my grandmother, my mom's mom, my grandmother's sister and her husband bought a little island on Flathead Lake a million years ago, I think in the 50s, but I could be wrong. Um, So it's been decades, like 70 years. And they started having a family reunion on this little island on Flathead Lake every year. And that's where I grew up going every year. It could be freezing. I mean, there's a picture of my sister with a winter coat and mittens on one year on the island, or it could be beautiful 90 degrees and you're swimming in the lake and you're happy. Um, But my immediate family is very, very small. No cousins on my mom's side, no first cousins, um, only four on my dad's, but this family reunion is on my mom's side. But grandma, uh, grandmother's older sister is the one that bought the island. There's six siblings in that family. And then um, it was their mother who was the oldest of nine siblings, I want to say. Like the decades, I could be getting that wrong, but all of those siblings, children, grandchildren, etc., came to the family reunion. And so I got to learn how all of those generational relationships worked. My second cousin twice removed, my third cousin, etc. I, I learned all of that and I loved it. Um, I loved knowing how everybody fit into that family tree. So even though <clears throat> once I became an adult and I started going other places on the 4th of July, I think I've been off the island on the 4th as much more, many more years that I've been on the island. That's where my heart always is on the 4th of July, very nostalgic. And this year, uh, my, my heart, my little heart grew four sizes this year because my great nephew had his first 4th of July on the island and he's so cute. He's, um, he's five months old. And so he got to have his first 4th of July island experience. Wish I could have been there, but pictures will have to do. So, At any rate, just thought I would share that with you. Do want to, of course, move on to the interview, which is why we are here. This week, I am talking to Kimberly G. Giratano about her book, Devil in Profile. This book is the second book in the Billy Levine mystery series. Let me give you the description of this book. Um, Unlicensed PI Billy Levine is trying to bank some extra cash. So she picks up hours working as a process server for another investigative firm. Mindless and mostly nine to five, Billy is content to simply hand over court documents until during a routine stakeout, she stumbles upon the corpse of an elderly man, an art collector with ties to Nazi Germany. (coughs) Compared to Billy, the dead man has it easy. Billy is feeling on edge lately. Maybe it's because her father is insisting his estranged kids come to his wedding in Sedona, or that her brother David is making plans to move out, or that a smug teaching assistant is getting underfoot on her latest case. 
Although it's possible she could use the help when the cops zero in on Billy's boyfriend, Aaron, and his connections to an international art ring. Turns out Aaron's stint in Israel has left him with more than just a thick scar across his neck. The woman he screwed over wants revenge, and she's determined to leverage Billy's murder, murder case to get it. With the de detectives focused on Aaron, Billy sets her sights on stopping a killer who is tying up loose ends, Billy being one of them. That is the description of, as I said, Devil in Profile, the second in the Billy Levine mystery series. I read this one. I have not read the first one. And I will say that uh, it can be read as a standalone. I read it as a standalone. I always prefer to start at the beginning of a series. I would, I would say you should start at the beginning because why not? If you can read one book, why not read two? They're both out, right? And um, I did feel at the beginning that there was a lot of backstory that I was missing that was being referenced from that first book. By the time I got maybe halfway through and, and, and then through the end of the book, I did feel like I was sufficiently caught up. I kind of had an idea of what happened in that first book, but I would suggest starting at the beginning just because as Julie Andrews said, it's a very good place to start, right? Um, but I really liked the book. It was fast paced. It was a lot of fun. It's um, thriller, mystery, but not too, um, it's not going to keep you up at night. It's not, <laughs> you know me and my eek, my, my eek factor. Um, it is Sarah approved on the eek factor scale. <laughs> I should actually make one of those and, and give you um, actual numbers. But like I said, fast paced. Billy is young. She makes some choices that as the reader, you're thinking, why but I'm looking forward to watching her grow as a character um, there's at least three books in the series so we'll see how she grows next book if there's more great but um, there's some real there's a really fun cast of secondary characters that have a lot of quirks and foibles and they play off of Billy's personality as she's making sometimes questionable choices, but she's also a young person with a lot of pressure on her in terms of family relationships and her relationship with her boyfriend and job, etc., etc. So she's got a lot that she's working through. At any rate, let's go ahead now and turn to the interview. Again, the book is called Devil in Profile. The author is Kimberly G. Giratano. Hi, Kimberly. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to have you here. We're going to talk about the second book in your Billy Levine series. Um, but before we get to the series and the book, if you wouldn't mind taking just a few moments to share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you. Sure. Um, my name is Kimberly Giratano. Uh, I am the author of Mysteries for Teens and Adults. I am also the author of the Billy Levine series. Uh, there's two books right now, uh, Death of a Dancing Queen and Devil in Profile. I am the chapter liaison for the National Board for Sisters in Crime, one of the largest crime fiction writing organizations in the entire world. I live in the Poconos. I'm originally from New Jersey, but I live in the Poconos and I live with a lot of nature. You know, I see porcupines and turkeys and deer and bears, just part of my everyday. And I have three children and I teach part time as well. Nice. The Poconos, I don't know. I always think of the Poconos in like movies and just some place some that people go I I I don't I've never people live there obviously but I, I in my brain people always go to the Poconos they used to and then they just started to live here like so I live in a community where the houses are all different I don't live in a typical like subdivision where like there's just different models of the homes all of the houses are different because they've all been commissioned and built some of them started out as little bungalows vacation bungalows for like Manhattanites and then as like time went on, people relocated here and started just building larger homes to live in. So yes, it used to be like part of where I live has old honeymoon um, resorts that have been bought up by uh, the government and converted into like national parks and things hmm. like that. I, not national, state, state parks. Right. The Delaware Water Gap is like a region. But anyway, yeah. So now people just live here, <laughs> including myself. Yeah, interesting. But nature is good. That's nice. I mean, yeah, I love it. Um, so the books, this one is the second um, with the main character of Billy Levine. Can you just start by giving an overview of the series as a whole? Sure. I liken Billy Levine to um, an East Coast Jewish Veronica Mars. Like that's, she's 24 years old. She's a private investigator. Uh, she works under her grandpa 
and um, she lives in New Jersey because that's where I grew up in New Jersey. And it's set in North Jersey, which has a really great kind of hard boiled noir vibe. If you've ever been to North Jersey, you know what I'm talking about, especially like uh, the east part of the state. And she is also taking care of her mother who has early onset Alzheimer's disease. So she's a young woman take with huge responsibilities. And one of those is caring for a parent that, that unfortunately is being ravaged by this disease, but there's a lot of humor in it. It's not like a downer. Nobody's going to read it and go like, Whew, that was a lot. You're going to laugh. Right. <laughs> it's joyful, but it's also, you know, it's a page turner. It's everything I like in books. So right. I write it to my standards. I don't want anybody to leave going, Whew, that was a slog. Right. <laughs> what did it, what? Um, so I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun writing her. I have a lot of fun with her crimes, like what she's solving, the, the scrape she gets into. It's just, it's a lot of fun. I promise. Yeah. And I like that you, you likened it to Veronica Mars because she actually takes some time in um, the, the second book to watch Veronica Mars. <laughs> and she has opinions, of course, but. <laughs> like, oh, let's just put Veronica Mars in it. Exactly. I had so much fun with that. <laughs> Um, the first one is, oh, something with Dancing Queen. I apologize. Um, yes. Thank Death you. Of a dance. Yes. And then the, the second one, Devil in Profile. Um, that's the one that we are talking about, the newest one. So can you give an overview of this story and what Billy is getting up to? Devil in Profile has an art bent to it. So um, Billy is a private investigator, but she takes on some hours as a process server for another firm. So process servers are the ones that like serve papers, like Mr. Jones, you've been served, like that kind of thing. So she has to serve papers to an elderly man, a recluse, and he doesn't come out of his house. So it's kind of like a, a challenge for her. But anyway, there's a reason he doesn't come out of his house because he's dead. And she stumbles upon his body and it turns out he's a hoarder. And he also has ties to Nazi Germany. So I got to have a lot of fun with researching Nazi looted art. It makes like a, a whole, it's a whole theme in the book because I had read an article in the Atlantic about an elderly gentleman who was the son of Hildebrand Gerlitt, who was one of Hitler's art collectors, collectors in quotes, art thieves. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? And he would sell off pieces of the art every once in a while to just pay his bills. Like he was hoarding the art that his father had left him that he'd stolen after the Third Reich fell. And he would he would sell the art for cash just to pay his bills like every so often. So he got caught on a train from Munich to Switzerland with all this cash on him. And the authorities got suspicious as to why he had all this money. And they started looking into his tax records and how this, this sort of story was discovered. So I used that as inspiration for Devil in Profile. So all the art mentioned in the book is real. I didn't make up any paintings. I didn't make up any artists. Like, that's all real. Uh, so I had a lot of fun with that that historical time period I was like so inspired I was like oh my god I have to put this in a book and voila I did and of course then Billy's running from you know European gangs and she gets into massive amounts of trouble and it was just a joy to write her <laughs> watch her try to climb out of these situations I'm like, and, and so, as a writer I gotta do this I gotta get her out of here she's not, yes. like, I'm not watching her I have to <laughs> so that she can get out of this and I was like ah what did I do yeah so you're one of those authors that likes to put your characters into you're mean apparently or yeah, you to your characters is that what I'm hearing <laughs> I, I, I need to make them suffer and I've been told that I'm like you know Geritano really puts the kitchen sink into making her character suffer and it's like I do but they'll be okay it's they'll just fun <laughs> Right. But, the, you know, then that is that is the flip side. You've put her into this situation. Now, Kimberly, <laughs> um, you have to get her out. So are you um, are you a plotter or a pantser? Do you know how she's getting out of these things before you get her into them? Or is it just kind of figuring it out as you go? I plot everything, but that doesn't mean I know everything when I when I write so I plot things out I'm like all right this scene will lead to this scene will lead to this scene and so forth and but then I get into the scene and I don't exactly necessarily know how things will unfold like I have to figure it out so 
I'm not that, I mean, I plot pretty heavily, but like the intricacies of a scene that just comes from the writing itself. And sometimes I discover things. I'm like, oh, I just, like in my third book, I'm like, oh, I threw in a character I had not intended for. I was like, but I like this. I'm going to keep it. So it could, you know, you, you plan and then, you know, you write and then you're like, ugh, what did I do? So. Yeah. I love how often authors talk about characters either surprising them or showing up where they're least expected. Here we have um, a, an entirely new character that wasn't planned on and just decided, you know what, I really need to be in your book. <laughs> I think that's great. I, um, I, I project, of course, whenever I talk to authors and I, I don't know how I would feel if just a whole new character showed up. Would I be excited? Would I be like freaking out a little bit? I'm not sure. Um, there's a new character that just showed up. <laughs> My dog who wants in the bedroom because she should have gone in when I told her to. At any rate, let's go ahead and take our first break of this episode. When we come back, we'll be talking more about characters and character development, how that works for Kimberly. You are tuned in to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great. I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that paid. I need a change in my life, cause I don't feel alive, and there's nothing that makes me happy. Oh. Hold my beer for a minute I'm about to quit my job Cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip And I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there Till I feel like I'm winning all oh, And this is just the beginning I need a big change Help me feel like living I need a big swing Home runs I'm hitting And I'll never look back Moving on till I get it all And we all got dreams We all want things But what you gonna do for it? How you gonna move for it? What you gonna be? And do you believe Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with author Kimberly G. Giratano. Before the break, we were talking about characters and how they sometimes just appear out of nowhere. As we get into segment two, I do want to remind you that you can support Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with Kimberly G. Giratano. As we go into this second segment, I do want to remind you that you can support the podcast and the entire network by going to gsmcpodcast.info. You can leave a tip or a donation. You can leave a question and comment with the, that tip or donation. I'm happy to engage with any comments or questions you might have for me. Again, that's gsmcpodcast.info. It helps not only this podcast, but the network as a whole. And as I say, hopefully every time, thank you for all the support that you give in whatever form that support takes. So before the break, Kimberly was talking about a character that kind of appeared out of nowhere, um, which leads into the next part of our conversation where we are talking more about character and char characters and character development. Let's go ahead and return to that conversation with Kimberly. I would assume then that that kind of, you, you, you answered my next question a little bit in terms of character development. You probably have a pretty good idea of those characters going in, but then sometimes you're surprised either with a new character or characters doing things you weren't fully expecting. Is that accurate? Yeah, my characters live with me for a bit. I, I think about them a lot. I don't necessarily just go through life going, oh, what would Billy do in this situation? Because I life doesn't even present the situations Billy gets herself into. But I think about my characters quite often. Like they just travel with me. I'm driving. I think about them and, you know, a scene and what they would do. And so they're fully formed, I think, when I get to the page. What usually surprises me, and it's not so much about their characterization, but maybe who else I bring along for the ride. Or I or, or I develop I, I create a character because I feel like they would be a great foil or they'd be a great partner or they would bring some interest. And so that's that's really where I my subconscious kind of was like, she needs a friend here, she needs like a partner, she needs a nemesis. And that's when I'll bring them in. But yeah, my characters come pretty, some, they mostly come fully formed, my main ones. Sometimes 
peripheral characters need more development and I haven't given them the headspace. So then I have to really sit down and think about that. And are you, you cognizant when you, when you write peripheral characters, because they all have, there, there's some very um, colorful secondary characters in this book. Uh, some characters that make you just kind of want to flick them in the forehead. Um, but are you, are you really cognizant about making sure that their characteristics further Billy's story in some fashion? Yes. Like everybody should have a purpose <laughs> and a point. Um, you know, there's, there's like no fat. I want to say when sometimes women are writing and I have, I, I have a lot of characters in my novels. I, I, I read that constantly from readers. They're like, there's so many characters in this novel. I like a large cast. I think they mm -hmm. all bring something and allow me to have, allow me to explore the themes that I want to explore or allow me to like, just explore Billy's world through their eyes. So I have a lot of fun bringing in different viewpoints. Also, she lives in North Jersey. It's a very diverse, crazy place mm -hmm. to live. You know, they're just, it's just how it is. Um, I would so be so interested to know sometimes what characters resonate with readers a lot. Like I know Gramps is popular because I love writing him. He's so mm -hmm. much fun for grandfather. And but I always be curious to know, like, what characters you want to flick in the forehead. Is it just, like, the villainous ones? Because that I totally get, and they should be kind of like, no, nah, go away. But then I don't have the conflict. I don't have, like, the impetus. Right. right. But, well, I mean, yeah. I think I think it's the characters you want Billy to conflict with. Like, Jeremy, in this case, you know, he... <laughs> they're just yeah. meant to butt heads. Um, or... Um, just even some like uh and billy herself is she's young you can tell she's young um and she does not she has not quite developed that ability to tact she has not developed tact yet <laughs> and that could be I, young I, and maybe partly north jersey i don't know but you know there's times when you're like billy seriously do you <laughs> um there's a conversation and i can't think uh, his name billy is it the the guy at the storage unit with the birds and you know she really could have finessed that a lot better she did not <laughs> yeah it's it, you know what part of it is just the just a new jersey it's not that Jer new jerseyans don't have tact we just don't have time to be tactful right. just get it out what what do you want from me um i feels like a very jersey way to kind of go through life but yeah i didn't filter at 24 i would just say whatever i was thinking and it was never you know, it comes like tact it comes with age. It comes with sometimes. I think it does. Right. You know, I definitely become more polite as I get older. And I think, mm -hmm. oh, how do I handle this situation in a better way? But at 24, I did not. And neither no. did Billy. No. And I, at 24, you think you're right a lot more than you. Yeah. You really, so. It's so fun to write. Uh, first of all, it's so fun to write baddies. So the more sinister the character, the more fun I'm having. And it is fun to kind of watch her manipulate situations to her advantage as well. And then having to like, you know, deal with the consequences of that and and how she does have to be like, wait, I gotta, I gotta smooth this. I gotta be a little more suave. And I, I don't know. I just I have so much fun. And then I get to write funny one liners, which I also enjoy. So sure. Yeah. And it means, I mean, you've got to have, it, it gives her a place to start. And then I mean, I'm, I'm excited to find out, you just watch her progress because she, she will start, you know, figuring things out more as she goes on, it, which brings me to the next question of, do you have an end point in mind? Or are you just going to write as long as Billy keeps giving you stories? How is that looking for you, the series? I mean, reality is I write Billy as much as my publisher will give me um, there's three books contracted for Billy right now. So the third book, Make a Killing, will be out June of 2025. So the draft is in. I'm just waiting on it. It's like, you know, that's like the boring author part. And, you know, we I, I don't know about readers, but like in order for series to keep going, readers just have to invest and they have to be willing to read you know, new books and, you know, to tell their friends about them and put it on social media, like word of mouth really helps authors out. I mean, that's the reality of it, that we are not a, we, we are not Netflix. We can't throw all our books out at once and have people yeah. binge. They are contracted book by book. So uh, yeah. right now we're contracted for three, Make a Killing was also like, they're always so much fun to write. Like, and I, I, 
try to use humor and suspense as a way to kind of discuss themes that I'm interested in. So in, in Devil and Profile, like there's a lot of Billy and her father, you know, there's, there's a lot of like parents and their children is a big theme. And in the third book I'm writing, I get to, I'm exploring like toxicity in corporate America is one of the things that I'll be kind of exploring. So I usually pick something that's meaningful to me that I want to talk about, but in, you know, doing so in a way that's accessible and entertaining and fun and kind of gets my point across as well. Yeah. And that's that what you were talking about. It's not, it, it is a heavy topic, like, you know, parenting and your parent child relationship and Billy's is not great with her father, but she, she I like that you put her in a situation um, with the, with Titus where she's suddenly <laughs> counseling him on dealing with his toxic parent. And she just, yeah. you know, 10 pages ago was completely floundering. So. Yeah. She's like, Oh wait, I got this. I could, yeah. I, I got you. Cause I'm working through all of this myself. So exactly. yeah. And it's, and it's, Again, so that's an example, I think, of when I'm writing and I'm drafting that, like, I don't see this character on the edge coming through, but then they do come through and I'm like, ah, oh, they support, you know, the whole, they 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 support the theme of what I'm trying to do and they sneak themselves in and I was like, ah, oh, this works out great. Like, yes. And then sometimes they'll bring a character and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, get them rid of them or <laughs> delete, them. just delete. God bless the delete. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I like the... And so I, sometimes it's all subconscious. Like I don't realize I'm doing it until I'm like, sure. ah, for me. What is it, do you think, that draws you to writing <clears throat> crime fiction, mysteries, et cetera? I was talking to somebody about, oh, I was, I was in a book club for my own book. Anyway, it, it mysteries give me, or give my characters, I would say, something to do while they're figuring themselves out. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a good crime fiction just provides a great plot, you know, avenue for, for them to tackle while they're discovering their character arc and, you know, overcoming their flaw. I was, I was joking that I don't, I don't know what I would write about if it wasn't that they had to solve something. Like, what are they doing? What's a scene look like? It's not yeah. like I need to do, or I'm interrogating a suspect or, you know, I need to run from some, I just don't know what they would do with themselves. So I, I, it's just what I wound up writing. Like my first novel that I wrote, Grunge Gods and Graveyards, which is a young adult mystery. I had set out to write a book. I wanted to pay homage to 90s alternative music because that's what I grew up on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I can't just write a love story to 90s grunge. I have to <laughs> tell a story. And so this sort of ghost story mystery unfurled. And it was my first novel that I started and finished and revised. It took me like six months to revise. I took a, a, a pace, like a pace your own class kind of thing. And I revised it. And I just realized I'm like, oh, I'm pretty good at creating these twisty mysteries and dropping in clues. Like, I'm pretty good at this. I didn't know at the time. And now that I've been doing it for 10 years, it's just a natural avenue I find for me to tell a story. Sure. So you actually kind of combine plot based novels with character driven novels because the the characters are growing you see you know you, you mentioned their arc and they're figuring things out that's the character driven side but you've got the plot actually giving them some avenue to tell their story i feel like plot gives these characters momentum it gives them agency yeah. otherwise you could just be sitting around having a discussion i don't know what happens and i read other genres it's not like i do i read historical fiction but there's always something that they're trying to get yeah i just find that the mystery for me is makes it we're trying to get a killer <laughs> like we're trying to figure out who killed somebody i right. just feel like it's for, for me when i'm writing i'm like that is like a very concrete thing to discover so you know um it works but you know you know in 10 years i could i could write something else i could write my you know where they just sit around and talk i don't know but <laughs> something has to happen <laughs> Yeah, so I just much easier for me. Like, we're looking for a killer. That's what's happening. That's what. Right. That's what we're. Doing. But the you know we've all read the books where they sit around and talk and it works brilliantly. And we've all read the books where they sit around and talk and you're like, dear God, why is nothing happening? Yeah, and that comes down to, you know what? I don't even know the magical formula anymore. I was talking to an author friend of mine, and I had just finished a bestseller. I don't read a lot of New York Times bestsellers. It's just because. 
I don't know why. I just don't, maybe because they're not available at my library. They're always on hold. So I never right. get around to it. I just finished this New York Times bestseller. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't put it down. I was reading it at the bus stop. I was reading. And I sometimes like nowadays I'm like, mm, what's on my phone? Like, you know, I know I should be reading, but I'm scrolling mindlessly. I couldn't put this book down. I took it with me everywhere. It was a page turner. So much drama. The writing was not exceptional by any means. And I don't, I would never dog on another author. So I will never say the name, but I was not floored by the voice. Let's just put it that way. I was not like, wow, this author's voice is really something. It wasn't. The, the story was so good that I didn't care about the narrative style at all. I just found myself not caring. I was like, what's going to happen next? It was just that good. So I don't know where I'm going with the story, except to say, I sometimes you're right. You can sit around and read a passage and they're just chit-chatting. And you're like, I could listen to them talk about a menu for 300 pages. I am so... <laughs> like into the characters and their and the and the author's narrative style just do it and then other times you know it's the story has to carry there has to be action there has to be movement i have to see this character doing crazy things or living this dramatic life otherwise i'm just not invested but and and so i don't know i think we had like a sad conversation my friend and i were on sometimes i guess story trumps everything cuz you know as writers we're so cognizant of how we how we craft sentences and how our voice comes into things. And so to realize like it didn't matter as long as there was a lot of drama. Mm -hmm. He was like, huh, <laughs> maybe I don't need to edit the sentence five times, you know, as long as I put her in some crazy situation. But, right. But again, you have to find what works best for you. Yes. I have to be pleased with my thoughts. Yes. So you mentioned edits for book three for Billy. Um, are you working on another work in progress at the moment as well? I am. Um, so I'm contracted for three books for Billy right now. So I'm working on something else until I see what happens with that. I'm writing a historical mystery set in 1951 Manhattan. So I've been researching like everything. When you write historical fiction, everything has to be researched. You know, we mm -hmm. think all oh, the clothing, the way they spoke. This is set in Manhattan. Like she takes a taxi. I need to know what the taxi looks like. Mm -hmm. She takes a subway car. What is what what line? What did they call the subway? They didn't they didn't use tokens in 1951. So now I'm like I'm like when did they? I know they stopped using tokens roughly. When did they start using tokens? Not 1951. So you know they stop at their you know a hotel. What is the hotel? Riverside Plaza Hotel. I picked. So now I have to research that. I have books on. U.S. Army nurses in World War II, baseball in the 40s and 50s, Bellevue Hospital is is, is a setting, so I had to get a book on that. Uh, I had to research, you know, World War II, soldiers during World War II, particularly North Africa I was looking into. So everything has to be researched. You read a ton, you put in a little, but because mm -hmm. otherwise, I don't know. I need to know what a scene looks like before yep. I can draft. And it's not just what does the room look like? It's what's the vibe. And Bellevue is a good example. She goes to Bellevue Hospital. What is What did Bellevue look like? I didn't, even reading this whole book, I didn't even really get a good image of what Bellevue looks like. But it's just, just I got a great history of it. So, and then yeah. writing notes. Anyway, that's what I'm working on. So it's been, I have like 20,000 words drafted, but the history is probably... I mean, researching the history is really fun, but I'm like, yeah. how do I get seamlessly so it doesn't seem like I'm giving you a report that I'm telling. <laughs> I, as you know, if you've been uh, following the podcast for a while, do love historical fiction and Manhattan in the early 50s sounds like a really fun time to set a, a book. As I mentioned, you know, I love old movies. Um, my husband and I love to watch old movies and um, especially Christmas time, New York in the 50s always feels really fun and nostalgic. Um, so I probably would get sucked into many, many rabbit holes of research, just trying to get all the details of that time period right. Maybe wouldn't even write a book because that sounds like so much fun to research. At any rate, we are going to take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, research in general. You're tuned in to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back.
For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Kimberly G. Giratano. Before the break, she was talking about her work in progress, which is set in Manhattan in the early 50s. I was fangirling a little bit about the time frame. Let's go ahead now and return to that conversation with Kimberly. Whenever authors talk about research, I feel like I don't know. I just, I, I don't feel bad exactly, but I kind of feel bad for authors because I know you have so much more information that you could give me. <laughs> and I know that I don't necessarily want to read that in the book that you're giving me, but uh, you know, like you've done so much research, you know, so much more than the tiny little snippet you can put into the book from the hours of research you do. I, I heard a fantasy author on a podcast say that historical fiction and fantasy, like high fantasy are sort of like, crafted from the same cloth which is intense world building and I thought that was really smart I, mm -hmm. I'm reading historical fiction right now by Helen Simonson it's the Hazelborn Ladies Motorcycle and Aviation Club I, it's a long title it's set in 1919 England right at the end of World War One it is so immersive and she does it seamlessly mm. it's great example of historical fiction done really well like I'm so impressed with it it's taking me forever to read because they wind up dissecting every sentence the way she yeah. does things. She slips in historical details. Like my new thing as an author is to see how many times I'm using the word it because it's just like to me. Like there, there are days where I can't, I can't avoid. It. I got to use the word it, but right. take it out. Can I put a better word in? You know, can yeah. be more just. So that's like a not maybe that's interesting to other authors, probably not to readers. But anyway, that's what I. <laughs> And her book, I'm like, she didn't use it once on this entire page. Every word is so precise and meaty and perfect. She is a good example of someone to read if you're looking how to kind of incorporate the historical details into the narrative. So it reads really nice. So that's what I've been doing. But yeah, there's a lot of research and you want to create the world. Like I'm trying to build this world with the historical details. And 1951 is tricky because there are there will be readers who are like, I was alive in 1951. And they may feel like something doesn't ring true or, you know, everybody's experiences are different. And I am trying to incorporate a lot of, it's, a, it's my love letter to New York City. It's my love letter to my ancestors and my husband's side of the family, you know, Italians and Jews who came to New York City to make better lives. Yeah. So that's well, and my Manhattan is so iconic, and there are so many movies set in Manhattan in that time period. So people, whether they were alive or not, are going to have something in their head because you know if they watch a lot of older movie, old movies like my husband and I do. Um, you know, so yeah. Very good point. Um, in terms of writing, you've been writing. You said for about ten years. Is it something that you always wanted to do? Did you decide? How did that, what was that journey like for you in terms of writing for publication? So writing, for, I've been a published author for 10 years. I started writing fiction when I was a young adult librarian, which was about 2007. I became a YA librarian. And at that time, Twilight was huge. Mm -hmm. Speculative fiction in YA was huge. And publishers were taking everything because there was just this explosion of interest in teen fiction that adults were reading and teen reading. And a lot of the times these publishers, it was a it was a gluttony of riches and a lot of what they were publishing was not great. And I was reading it all because I was buying it for the library. Yep. And so I was like, oh, I think I could do this because I went into college as a journalism major. I always was writing for my newspapers, high school newspaper. I was an editor at my college newspaper. And then I was a history major. So I was always writing nonfiction is what it ended up wound up being. And when I was a librarian, I just, I, I know it's terrible to think you've read a terrible book and you're like, oh, I can do this. How hard can this be? I mean, it's hard. Let's let, let Kim, right. did, yeah. 2000, Kim did not know. 2007, Kim didn't know. It's hard. But 
I tried NaNoWriMo. I tried, I, I, I read every book on craft I could find. I took like a cheap class on, right, on, on scenes, whatever. And then I joined Sisters in Crime in, in 2014, where I am on the board. And that has kind of given me my education. So I always was writing. Um, I just didn't know, I, I didn't think I could write fiction because I thought you needed an MFA. I thought you mm -hmm. needed to take college classes to be a writer. I, I always had in my head, like in order to do anything, you have to, you have to have a lot of education in it, but it became, you know, independent education, you know, self-taught reading, taking books apart, taking classes, learning. And now, you know, I'm 10 years into it. Not that I have my own system. I'm always tweaking things, but I'm much, so much more confident in what I'm doing. Like I'm very sure of myself Sure. in this thing of life. I am sure of myself. So yeah, that's that's the long story to a, a quick question. No, that's great. Out of all of that experience, then I know it's hard to kind of take one thing out of your 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 experience. But um, what advice would you give for someone who wants to write? Read widely. Obviously, you know, all authors say that read everything. You should read everything. But also take your favorite book, the one that you cannot live without, the one that you reread all the time and just dissect it. You know, what does the author do 10 pages in that or where is the scene where I'm like, oh, it's so amazing. Or what are the characters like that I can't, you know, live without? Uh, you know, what's the narrative style? I'm not saying you have to copy your favorite author's narrative style, but what is it about the way they write that draws you in? I would suggest like a case study of your favorite novel for sure. And and reading as a writer is not really enjoyable sometimes. I mm -hmm. that's why I read out the genre a lot. <clears throat> I read like I, like I don't I don't like when chefs you know work full time and they don't want to cook for themselves you know yep. kind of how it, sometimes it feels to read because I'm like wanting to dissect sentences one of my favorite authors is Mick Heron he writes the slow horses books it's an apple tv show it's so good um his ability his his way with language and his humor and his characterization are just outstanding it takes me forever to read one of his novels because I can't stop dissecting it and like, oh my God, look how he does it here and look at the scene and look how he creates these characters. And, you know, some of these characters, they're not, some of them are beloved, some of them are terrible, but I'm so absorbed by them. Mm. So it just becomes work when I read. But that's what I would suggest uh, somebody looking to, to write a novel is like, take it apart and, and see if you can put it together um, and, and, yeah, and analyze the hell out of a book that you love and why you love it. It might take the fun out of rereading it again. You'd be like, oh, <laughs> especially when you read your own work and you're like, I didn't do this thing I should have done. Could have made it better. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's, you're going to do that whatever you're doing um, is that you always are your own worst critic. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. You've mentioned a few of the authors that you like to read. Um, when you're not reading for research and you're just reading for you, what's your... What are some of your go-to authors and genres? Oh, uh, Holly Black, my all-time favorite author. She's from Jersey. She oh. writes young adult. And now she has an adult book out too, um, Book of Night. It's it's on my shelf somewhere. I don't actually buy a lot of books, like physical books anymore. I am a library user. I was a librarian. Um, my library will buy books if I ask them to. Heads up, everyone. If you're not aware of this, your library will purchase books that you want to read. You just ask them. Because... Yes. You want to read it, other people want to read it. So, and that's, I ask my library to buy books all the time so that I can enjoy them and then they go into circulation, other people can enjoy them. So that's what I do. But Holly Black is one of my most favorite authors in the entire universe. She writes the very like popular, The Cruel Prince, The Folk of the Air series. She writes a lot about fairies and fae. And she is a Jersey girl. She lives in Massachusetts. <laughs> I met her in person once many, many years ago. And I was so excited. I was an adult. I, I felt like I was meeting a rock star. I really love yeah. her so much. I like Maddie have... Steve. Go ahead. Oh, she kind of has rock star hair too. I don't think she ever has the same color hair anytime I see her. <clears throat> in general, I would just love to hang out with her. I met an author who knows her and I was like, tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> Band girl. <laughs> I was, I was fangirling. I think meeting authors in real life is like meeting a, a rock star. Um, I agree. It's, you know, incredible. So she's one of my favorites. I like Maggie Stiefwater. She writes The Raven Boys, um, the, the Raven Cycle. It's a great series of books. She, she 
she knows what she's doing. So, and young adult, those are my favorite. And then Mick Heron is one of my most favorite adult authors. I love, if I'm rereading books because they just bring me some type of comfort or joy, like you are, you know, that's, I love that. Um, so those are, those are kind of my favorite. I mean, I, I just, uh, like, and then I just discover new authors all the time, like Helen Simmons. And I'm like, wow, how have I not known your work? It's so good. So, yeah. and uh oh i'm gonna give a shout out to an author i just discovered um and i i don't know her personally uh rowan baird wrote the divorcees which is a book set in 1951 because i read it i was like oh it's set in the same period as my historical let me let me read it it is about women heading to who live on the reno nevada divorce ranches which had popped up in the 40s and 50s so that women could get quickie divorces you had to live in nevada for six weeks to establish residency and then you could go to court and get divorced really fast interesting so a whole industry popped up around this this need for women to get divorced and so wealthy women could stay at these ranches were like all you know little resorts they fed you they gave you how like an apartment they had a pool they would take you out to the casinos or to the bars and you could kind of like socialize and you would stay there for six weeks and you would get a local loyal, lawyer and then you can get divorced really fast. And a lot of time for these wealthy women, the, the ranches could be paid for by their fathers. They could be, be paid for by the soon to be ex-husband, whatever. But the writing for that novel was just fantastic. So if anybody's mm. looking for a kind of dark, well done, very well done uh, historical fiction, I'd recommend The Divorcees for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, you said you've three three children, correct? Do you I do. Do you have a favorite book that you've read with them throughout their their growing up? Oh, I know it's hard one. to choose a favorite. <laughs> I shouldn't a lot. Hmm. You know what my kid so I have two boys and a girl. My daughter is 10, she still reads because she doesn't have a phone. Honestly, mm -hmm. once the kids got my boys got cell phones, they were not interested in reading fiction anymore. And my oldest read a lot. He's had a copy of the Hunger Games for like years and he hasn't opened it he has to read fahrenheit 451 for high school i'm like are you gonna get on that like get on that um my favorite books to read as a kid were my mom's favorite books to read she used to go to the library and pick up books and just bring them home and i would just read them uh that's probably the only thing that i just blindly would take is any you know here read this book and i was like okay i i didn't have like preconceived notions about what i wanted to read and didn't want to read when i was a kid Whereas my children do, um, a Diary of a Wimpy Kid was really popular. And so my oldest wanted to read books like that. And believe it or not, there weren't as many as you would think. Fantasy is a huge, in middle grade, for example. Yeah. Fantasy yeah. is so big that if he was into the genre, I could just, it, it, you know, like just an abundance of riches. But believe yeah. it or not, Diary of a Wimpy Kid books, the funny, realistic, kind of goofy storytelling that's geared toward boys, there wasn't as many as you would think, yeah. like we had seen everything. So, but I was a kid, I read um, very old school stuff because it was old to my mom even at the time, but like The Moffats by Eleanor Estes, like mm -hmm. those books were written, I think in the 1930s and they were a nostalgic story for the author growing up at the turn of the century, but I read them, I love them. Of course I read Harry Potter, like, you know, but I read it late because Harry Potter the fourth book came out when I was in grad school. So I read it in college because that's mm -hmm. when the books were around and stuff. But yeah, my kids, my boys are real into sports now. So if they're reading anything, it is sports blogs and articles. They're just yep. huge fans. But my daughter right now, she likes graphic novels, loves graphic novels. So she reads a lot of that. And I love graphic novels as an entryway for kids to be reading, but I have found it hard now for her to just pick up a regular novel. Yeah. Because there's a lot of text and she's flying through these books and there's a sense of accomplishment. And I get it. Like I read a novella not that long ago. And I was like, oh, I finished a book. <laughs> yeah. Fast. Because it's a novella. It's short. And there, and I was like, I felt great. I was like, oh, I, I think I read three books this month. That's a lot for me. Yeah. Yeah. I know you, you see the people on TikTok and you're like, this is what I read in June. And they, they, they list like 47 books. I'm like, did you, did you, I mean, okay, that's great. But wow. Kate Quinn, famous Kate Quinn, the historical fiction author, um, the Alice Network. 
she's just the Briar Club's coming out. She reads like I, she showed an image of what she read for them. I think it was like thirty bucks or something. I don't know how she does because she's yeah. also re research. I was in, I was floored, and then I, I felt like a slacker because I am. I have downtime, but I'm like on my phone, and it's such an addiction. I just wish I could take it and yeet it into the sun, but you know yeah. you need this. Well, my it's not an excuse, but because I moved to Europe and I did not bring books with me and I do not have physical books anymore because, you know, customs and everything, it's a lot more difficult for authors to send me books. I read on my phone. <laughs> so it's really easy to be reading on my phone and then be like, oh, what's going on on TikTok? Or mm, I'm going to scroll over here to this social media. I deleted the TikTok app. I deleted it. I mean, my yeah. husband works and then he's like, you should delete the app. So I deleted it's the app. suck. It is a time suck. And then I had to put, uh, I had to put time restraints on myself, a, a 40 something year old woman to like Instagram limit to an hour threads limit to an hour threads was kind of, I was just getting, I'm like, ah, like when I go on threads, the world is ending and it, I, I, I get it, but it's not helping. None of this is productive conversation. Doom scrolling. No, never. It's not helpful. It's just like, this is not how we are helping each other. Um, I was like, all right, let me just limit it. So, and then it's helped me out a lot. And now I'm just, I'm just taking my book with me. I'm taking it down to the kitchen so that if I have a few minutes, I'll read while I'm eating or drinking coffee. I started writing in the very early morning, handwriting, a, a, a draft for a book, not my historical for just a couple, like five, maybe I'm doing 500 words for three, for like 30 minutes kind of thing. Like that'll take forever to do. And I'm writing a hand draft just so I can try something completely new and just to see how it taps into my subconscious, but I'll do it in the morning. Like no pressure. Nobody knows about this project, you know, that kind of thing, but anything to get me away from the phone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, I hear, I hear you. So this is sort of a, a tangentially on topic, but off topic as well. Kimberly was talking about handwriting in the mornings and that just made me think about me in college. I would always handwrite the first draft of any paper, not because I was trying to stay off social media because I'm a Gen X. Social media did not exist when I was in college. <laughs> thank goodness. Um, I don't know why I say thank goodness. I was the most boring person you've ever met. Uh, but uh, Social media did not exist when I was in college, but I would, I, because I'm Gen X, I had computer classes in high school, but um, still was used to writing everything. And so that blinking cursor would just blink at me on the blank, on the blank page. And I could not for the life of me write the first draft of anything. And I was a history major. So there's a lot of papers to write. Couldn't do it. Had to handwrite the first draft. And then the second draft would be when I typed in that handwritten draft into my computer word processor for the first few semesters. And then I would edit as I would go and kind of tweak as I started typing in that what became the second draft. But um, yeah, I don't know, just kind of, uh, I guess the theme of the day is nostalgia as I think back on different things. Uh, but we are going to take the third break of this podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about uh, where you can find Kimberly on the internet in terms of website and social media presence. Stay tuned. You are listening to and or watching the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Kimberly was talking about finding ways to be more present in her writing and less present on social media. Probably a lot of us have that issue in various forms and capacities. I know I certainly do, as we talked about. Uh, that does lead kind of ironically. I don't know if, am I using the Alanis Morissette version of ironic here? Possibly. But it does lead into my next question, which deals with social media. So let's return to the conclusion of my conversation with Kimberly. Um, internet presence, if people want to learn more about you and your books. So website, if you have one and any, <laughs> I, that's, now I see, now I feel silly following up, but any social media that you're active on. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's part of the, it's part of our Absolutely. lives. I just, it's like drinking, right? Alcohol's available. A glass of wine is nice, but I'm not, you know, like can't finish polish off a bottle of wine by yourself. Like we have to, I have to learn to moderate the work, the techno technological world around me. Anyway, you can find me online at Kimberly G Uh, my last name's a mouthful. It's G I A R R A T A N O. But my author name is my web address. And then all my social media is on there. I, I hang out on Instagram. I like Instagram, you know, like I love when authors post things about their writing and their lives. Um, so I'll hang out there and I'm on threads. Um, and I'll jump on Twitter once in a while now. I really limited my Twitter in interaction. And, uh, but, I find my time is just better spent if I am reading. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to make sure that that is what I'm mostly doing in my free time is reading. And yeah, I mean, just yeah. it's summer, like it's summer here. It's not, uh, not all over the world, but it's in the Northeast. It's very hot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You got the, there's way too much heat going on in the U S right now. Well, the humidity yesterday. I, so one other thing that I do besides write is I volunteer locally um because i have the time and it, it is a privilege to do so and i really enjoy it it was so hot yesterday though outside in the pocono i'm like this cannot be real life it felt like orlando in august it just felt like a, a wall of moisture smacking you in the face and then it rained last night and you know how after it rained you go out and you're like oh it cooled down a bit mm -mm. didn't do anything it yeah on humid and i love heat because i can't stand winter but this is something else so yeah. it is summer. i'm just trying to enjoy being outside not having like you know you forget how you wear a coat for like 75 percent of the year and you're like oh, so nice here. <laughs> yeah no humidity changes everything it's <laughs> i know i went to um oh i saw tori amos last year and the opening act was from arizona and they're like we're from arizona and we can't believe that your humidity like, yeah. like, we can't believe how hot it is here. And I was like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the um, I grew up in Montana and then I moved to Texas and I could not get, I never got used to the fact that it did not cool off when it rained. Like in Montana, if it rains, you're putting on a coat, you are putting on socks. It's, it's, it's cool. It's not. And then in, in Texas, it's like bath water. What's the, what's the um, heat like where you are now? Here it was 92 days ago, but now it's in the 80s. It we get 300 days a year of sun, and the average temperature is mid 70s, so pretty darn nice. So, I was in Europe during that record breaking heat wave where it killed all those people. It was yeah. 2003. I was there, I did a month in Spain in Salamanca, and it was so hot like over a hundred. Yeah. And I was, I get, I remember getting on the phone with my mom and I'm like, I just feel so weird. She's like, you're not hydrating enough. I'm like, I carry a liter of water, like a frozen or three liters of water. We'd freeze it and, and then we'd take it with us to class, but it wasn't enough water. Like the cognitive decline when you are that hot, mm -hmm. don't understand. Like I didn't, I was, yeah, I just remember that. I'm like, now I know why all these people died. Because they don't yeah. also like going into a supermarket to stand next to the freezer section just to get some relief because you can't get any relief. There's no AC. But yeah. That's what I remember. Yep. And I'm still not, I've been here two years, over two years, and I still cannot get Celsius in my brain. So I say it's been, it's 90 and people look at me like, I don't know what that means. And I say, I don't, 40, 35, I don't remember. <laughs> 35 doesn't yeah. seem hot to me, but it is. 
converting converting to Celsius every time I have a conversation with my friend who's English. But she knows Fahrenheit, so she'll be like, it's 35, and I'll be like, well, what is that? She's like, it's 90 something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I kind of can do it. I can do it that way, roughly, but I can't do it from 90 to <laughs> Celsius. Learned so. in math. We did. I just <laughs> Yeah, math. No one said there'd be math. Uh, <laughs> back to books and writing. Is there anything that we have not covered, Kimberly, that you want to make sure that you highlight? No, I just, um, I hope people read this, uh, watch this, you know, get the books from the library. I can't stress that enough. And if your library doesn't have it, make them buy it. Uh, especially, and if any writers are watching that, like uh, watching and listening, like, I would encourage you to encourage people to use a library as much as possible. I There was some discussion not that long ago on social media about writers, authors in particular, like we don't need to voice sales, you know, upon the readership. Libraries pay more for your book and then it gets read by a ton of people. Like having your book in a library, which is a privilege not everyone gets it, especially if you're an indie author. My indie titles were not really available in the library. It wasn't until I was traditionally published that I could see my books in libraries because there's, you know, there's a distribution network involved and it makes it easy for libraries to get your books. But, you know, libraries, seeing more libraries carry my books and knowing that they read the first book, they're going to want the second book and read the third book. Like, I just can't stress it enough. Like, really support your local libraries. They need it so badly. And readers are, we're, we're addicted. So if you often, readers will read a library book and then they'll buy it because they want it. <laughs> so yes, libraries are a good, good gateway for your books selling. Yeah. So you know, if somebody says they got your book from the library, you just feel like that is amazing. I am, I, I get giddy. I get mm -hmm. giddy when I get my books in a library. I went um, to Seattle for a conference and I, we just happened to be by the public library and I, I went and found my book. I was giddy. Nice. Oh. I love it. That's all I want to do. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your weekend to talk to me um, about Billy and the series and writing in general. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> thank you once again for Kimberly for joining me. You can tell she says she loves talking about this stuff and you can absolutely tell she was so much fun to talk to. Uh, the, the joy of writing in her books uh, clearly comes through in uh, her conversations about her current works, her works in progress, her past works, etc. So it was a lot of fun to talk to Kimberly. As I said at the beginning, if you are... Um, looking for a good mystery series uh you want the first two books they are out uh the, the billy levine series is a good place to start um i need to create a graphic with my eek factor <laughs> to give you a better idea this one is fast paced it has some great characters in it not high on the it's going to keep you up at night it's going to keep you turning those pages there is some there's some suspense there are some some moments that you're thinking whoo how are we getting out of this one but it's not uh, it's not like it's not graphic or violent or the, but you know i mean it's a mystery there are dead bodies uh, so i would assume that you would be prepared for that going in but 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 lower on the eek factor for me which i appreciate especially because um I'm coming off of five interviews in a row where I'm talking about thrillers. Uh, next, the, the one that I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment, please join me on Friday, is another thriller. But uh, for me, you know, thrillers I'm coming to appreciate more. Never, I think, in my life have I read five thrillers in a row. <laughs> So this has been this has been a really fun exercise because they've all been different levels on the eek factor, right? got to make that graphic. Um, and it's been really fun to read different types of mysteries, different types of suspense, different types of thriller. And it's been a fun exercise for me. So speaking of that, I hope that you will join me for the next episode when I'll be speaking with author S.B. Caves. We're talking about his thriller, Honeycomb. This one is higher on the eek factor. When I was sent the email initially asking if I wanted to have SB on the podcast, it was described as Big Brother meets Black Mirror. That is a very good one-line description of this book. It is, whew, there's a lot that's going on. You're going to have to tune into the interview to find out more about this book, but you can see Seven Days, Six Strangers, One Experimental Drug. Eh, two little teasers for you. 
that those those three lines and then Big Brother meets Black Mirror. So join me on Friday's episode when I will be speaking with SB. As a reminder, um, in terms of Friday's episode, if you like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to or watching this podcast on, you're going to receive a notification anytime there is a new episode. That way, when we have two episodes in a week, which we do this week and again next week, cool, you're going to get a notification that there is a new episode out. And when I'm having weird weeks and they come out on the wrong day, you'll get a notification that there's a new episode. So like, follow, subscribe. Also, leave a positive review that really helps the algorithm. Just like leaving a review for your favorite authors um, really helps get their books into more the hands of more readers. Leaving a review of this podcast is going to get it out to more readers. And I greatly, greatly appreciate that. Uh, that's another way that you can support the podcast. Don't stress. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can be one line. It can be whatever, whatever works best for you. I appreciate it whatever it is in you to do to support this podcast. Also, you can find the podcast on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, and TikTok. Love interacting with you all. So if you do come follow the podcast, and of course me by extension, tell me what you're reading. Tell me which authors that I've interviewed that you have read and enjoyed. Tell me what's on your TBR. You know, I say this every week, I'm nosy come and feed my nosiness in terms of your your TBRs and, and your favorite authors, etc. Love to just add to my never shrinking, always growing books that I want to read someday. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Please join me again on Friday. In the meantime, whatever life is handing you this week, I hope it is handing you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go to.